Hello and welcome to the Asian Peace Talks. This is a podcast series launched by the Asian Peace Program of the Asia Research Institute at the National University of Singapore. The goal of the Asian Peace Program is a noble one, to try to preserve and strengthen peace in Asia. With our limited resources, we have to take a modest approach. Nonetheless, just as a small acupuncture needle can make a big difference, we hope that our monthly policy essays and this new podcast series will make a big difference and strengthen the peace regimes in Asia. I'm Kishore Mabubani, the host of the Asian Peace Talks. For the third episode of this podcast series, we are delighted to interview Dr. Farish No, a renowned scholar of Southeast Asian history and culture. Farish No is Associate Professor at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University. He is a Malaysian citizen who has resided in Singapore for many years. More interestingly, he is also of Javanese, European, Arab, and Indian ancestry. This may explain the rich mind that he has. He's widely known for his research covering the political history of Southeast Asia and religio-political movements in the region. He's the author of several books, including America's Encounter with Southeast Asia, 1800 to 1900 Before the Pivot. Secondly, The Discursive Construction of Southeast Asia in 19th Century Colonial Capitalist Discourse. And thirdly, The Madrasa in Asia, Political Activism and Transnational Linkages. In addition to his scholarly output, Farish has also hosted several documentary series for Channel News Asia, including the highly successful My Southeast Asia with Dr. Farish and Inventing Southeast Asia with Dr. Farish. Thank you very much, Farish, Thank you for, for sure. joining us. Yeah. In my view, and I suspect the view of many, <laughs> Southeast Asia is one of the most fascinating corners of planet Earth. It is by far the most diverse out of 650 million people. There's 250 million Muslims, 150 million Christians, 200 million Buddhists, along with Hindus, Taoists, communists, mm -hmm. among others. Mm -hmm. The big question is whether Southeast Asia is one community or whether it is a region divided into many silos, especially national silos. Farish, if I've understood your writings well... You have been suggesting that while in the modern era we have been focused on the different nation-states as distinct and different entities, there are actually organic links between the Southeast Asian nation-states. For example, you mentioned the Dayaks. The Dayaks in Malaysia and the Dayaks in Indonesia feel that they are part of one community. So clearly, one goal I have in my conversation today, Farish, with you is to try and draw out the many organic links within different Southeast Asian nation states. In my view, these organic links may also explain why Southeast Asia is at peace. And since the goal of the Asian Peace Program where this podcast series is based uh, is to promote peace in Southeast Asia, we have to understand the deeper forces creating peace in Southeast Asia. And since these links are organic, let's try to have an organic conversation. We are going to roam over many areas and issues, and I hope that this organic conversation will help to throw new light on Southeast Asia for the many listeners uh, of this program who come from all over the world. So my first question is about one of the most surprising events I personally have seen recently. As we all know, the Philippines is the world's fifth largest Christian country, it's also the largest Christian country in Asia and Southeast Asia. In November 2017, uh, President Duterte hosted the heads of state of the United States, China, Japan, India, Russia, and the ASEAN countries. Clearly, he wanted to make an impression on the world's most powerful leaders. I would have expected him to stage a performance that reflected the Western or Christian origins of Philippines culture. Instead, he staged a performance of the Ramayana. This clearly shocked me. Can you explain to our listeners what happened? How did a Christian country use a Hindu Ramayana performance to highlight a key aspect of its identity? Over to you, Farish. Well, I think when we look at this particular event, yeah, and unfortunately, unlike you, I was not present. I 
came to know of the event by reading reports about it. But I think what happened here was something very interesting, where we see perhaps on the part of the Philippine government, the Duterte administration, a conscious attempt to restate in a very clear way the long historical connection, the cultural connections between the peoples of the Philippines and the other communities of Southeast Asia. And so when we talk about the Ramayana here, I mean, the Ramayana in Southeast Asia, although, of course, in terms of its origins, this is an epic poem that originated from South Asia, from a place that we now today call India. But its reception in Southeast Asia is interesting because as these uh, epics and myths, you know, traveled beyond the borders of Southeast, South Asia and, and came to Southeast Asia, they were also adapted and adopted by the communities of Southeast Asia. They were made local. So what we are seeing here is perhaps an attempt on the part of the Duterte administration to say that, hey, hang on, stop thinking of the Philippines as, you know, a Southeast Asian country that's entirely, you know, um, modeled on a kind of Western or American model. Think of us as Southeast Asians. We share these cultural connections with our neighbors. And these connections are longstanding. They are old. They predate the creation of the Philippines. They predate the creation of, you know, the, the states of Southeast Asia. And this is something organic because it's part and parcel of, you know, our popular myths, our popular culture. And these are things that resonate with our people. So it's a reminder not only to the world, but also to the Philippines itself that, you know, we are actually a complex country. You know, yes, of course, the Philippines is largely majority Catholic, but there are also many other communities in the Philippines. There are many uh, linguistic groups, there are many cultural groups, and, you know, there's no such thing as a homogenous Filipino. It doesn't exist. There's no Filipino race per se. So the Filipinos are themselves a very complex people. And I think it's, it's refreshing to see this attempt to remind ourselves and in this case, reminding the people of the Philippines themselves that actually they are a complex community and we, we are part of a complex Southeast Asia. Uh, because I think, you know, you and I, Kisho, we've been talking about this for a long time, right? We are, I think, a bit tired of the way in which Southeast Asia gets reduced, you know, as if when people talk about Southeast Asians, as if we are all, you know, one community. We are not. Mm. We are, there's, there's enormous diversity in Southeast Asia, cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, religious diversity. And that's mm. why, and I agree with you, our region is incredibly rich as an area of research and study because we are a complex people. By the way, I'm so glad you touched upon the organic links and the complexity and diversity of Southeast Asia because, as you said, that's not very well known at all. And I'm going to now move to another example of how Southeast Asia can often cross different cultures. Mm -hmm. And this, I'm going to switch now from Philippines to Indonesia Indonesia is, of course, the world's most populous Islamic country, yet it also has strong Hindu traditions. And personally, when I visit Jakarta, I'm always amazed by the huge Arjuna Vijaya statue across the presidential palace and the Istiqlal Mosque, you know. And as you, as you know, Arjuna represents a great warrior fighting to preserve righteousness in the Mahabharata. And it was actually built by President Suharto not too long ago in 1987, so what do you think was the signal that President Suharto was trying to send to the largely Muslim population of Indonesia by building this Arjuna statue right in the heart of the capital? Well, I think uh, we have to actually set this in its historical context. Mm -hmm. uh, here we're talking about the Suharto regime, mm -hmm. and we're talking about a different mode of government. It's a very different form of politics compared mm -hmm. to the politics that we see in Indonesia today. So, of course... In the 80s, the, this was the time of the new order, the Order Baru in Indonesia. And, well, it would be far-fetched to claim that this was a, you know, a liberal democratic society. Mm. So here we have, I think, something quite interesting, which is an instance where you have a government, a state in Southeast Asia, attempting to restate the reality of, you know, complexity and pluralism, diversity, in an already diverse country, yeah? Mm. There's nothing wrong with that per se. And Indonesians are aware of this, you know? I mean, mm. if you look at, you know, the elements of Indonesian pop culture today, from dangdut music to the shadow puppets, Wayang Kulit, and um, the, the popular stories, the mythologies that, you know, they're all mixed. Everything mm. is mixed. Even dangdut music has elements of Indian music and what have you. There's nothing wrong because that's organic, that's real. Mm. However... When we talk about um, projects that were initiated by the Suharto government, well, some critics would argue that 
this was a, an instance of top-down pluralization where where you have the Suharto government at that time worried about you know uh, challenges to the state that came in the form of religious politics. And and we know that during the Suharto regime, there was a deep distrust between the Suharto government and religious forces in Indonesian society, particularly Muslims. So the efforts by the Suharto government to emphasize the plurality and complexity of Indonesian society, I think was not met positively by some elements of Indonesian society who, who basically said, okay, fine, we understand that we are a complex society. We do have a complex history. We do have a very rich history. But at the same time, you can't ignore the realities of life in Indonesia today. And many of the concerns that were being raised by the, say, Islamist parties or Islamist movements at the time were legitimate ones that were related to things like, you know, poverty, inequality in society and what have you. And so here you have an instance of a kind of top-down state social engineering, where, where the state then basically tries to, to make you comfortable with pluralism. And this is the problem that we have. Societies are plural and complex, but I think as human beings, you and I, uh, anyone, you know, uh, would not want to have this complexity forced on us. You know, mm -hmm. allow allow us to actually adapt to our own complexity. All mm -hmm. of us are complex human beings. Allow mm -hmm. us to deal with our complexity on our own terms, rather than having it, you know, impressed on us from above. And I think a lot of the projects uh, that were done, particularly in the last stages of the Suharto administration you know, betrayed a kind of insecurity on the part of the regime then that they were worried particularly about the rise of religious activism in the country. And and so Indonesia already has a very long history of being comfortable and able to adapt and live with diversity and difference. But when you have, you know, institutions, in a sense, almost, you know, compelling people to be open-minded, it actually sometimes, you know, turns out to be counterproductive. You actually mm. make them even more conservative. You make them mm. even more resistant to mm. complexity and pluralism. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Suharto was definitely a top-down mm. authoritarian ruler, mm. and I actually met him in person once mm. So I, I, and shook hands with him. So I know what a, a surprise it is under mm. his Javanese exterior. Mm. He's actually a very, very tough guy. But what's interesting is that in many countries, when you have strong top-down rule that holds a country together, mm -hmm. when the strong top-down ruler disappears, mm -hmm. when there are more democratic tendencies surface, you get divisions mm -hmm. and countries breaking apart, as you saw in mm -hmm. Yugoslavia, for mm -hmm. example. And Indonesia is, of course, more diverse mm -hmm. than Yugoslavia is. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that now Indonesia, actually, in my view, has the most successful democracy in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. In many ways, it has a much more diverse, mm -hmm. uh, bottom-up mm -hmm. uh, political culture mm -hmm. evolving in that. But despite the, the shift from a top-down to bottom-up mm -hmm. democratic system, the appreciation of the diversity mm -hmm. continues. So mm -hmm. there's, unlike, like say, in Afghanistan, which tore down the Bamiyan statues, mm -hmm. There is absolutely no desire in Indonesia, as far as I can tell, to wipe out its Hindu heritage. Mm -hmm. yes. So how do you explain the fact then now, mm -hmm. in a more democratic Indonesia, mm -hmm. what creates this respect for diversity? I think the it boils down to something that's actually very simple and very mundane. Mm -hmm. The idea that you know this diversity is ours. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and so it's very rare when you're in Indonesia and you talk to just simple, ordinary Indonesians, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's very rare for them to see things like, you know, uh, diverse forms of batik or diverse types of music or, mm -hmm. or the historical monuments as something foreign. Because you have a society that's comfortable with the fact that it has a complex past, mm -hmm. you also have a sense of ownership. These are ours. Mm -hmm. yeah? So one, one interesting thing is if you go to... Indonesia, and, and you, know, you and I are both, you know, very familiar with Indonesia, right? We, we, we mm. practically live half our, half our lives there. So if you go to Indonesia, say on a national holiday, mm. uh, or say on Kartini Day, or mm. Independence Day, or even a religious holiday, uh, it's surprising to see that, you know, thousands of people go to places like Prambanan or Borobudur for picnics, mm. right? And why is it? Because they, they feel that this is ours. This is mm. ours. And I remember very clearly once while doing field work, I was um, at the Gudung Songo temple complex in the mountains, and I watched this family. They were having a picnic. It was one national holiday. And this little boy asked his mum, 
mom, who built these, you know, monuments? Mm. And the mom said, oh, you know, our ancestors did. Mm. And these are ours. Mm. Yeah, these are ours. So Indonesians take enormous pride in that. They take ownership of mm. this, you know. So it's not seen as some foreign, you know, cultural imposition, mm. uh, you know, of kind of foreign cultural imperialism or whatever. This is ours. This is our mm. stuff, you know, and they're proud of it. Although, of course, you know, sometimes, as you and I both know, this pride can also go slightly too far to the point yeah. where they get annoyed when other people want to use batik as well mm. or whatever. So it, it can lead to a kind of a kind of cultural nationalism. Mm. But in most instances, it's actually very mundane. And so mm. it boils down to, you know, are you comfortable with being a complex human being? And are you comfortable being a nation that has a complex past? Mm. If that comfort zone is there... Mm then these things are not problematic. I think if you look at modern human history, whenever we've seen things like, you know, pogroms or, you know, cultural purification mm. campaigns, you know, you know, whether it's Nazi Germany or what have you, these things happen when there is a political economic crisis and then you need scapegoats and you need to blame the other. Um, I think the tolerance that we see in Indonesia is partly due to the fact that by and large, there's been, you know, a lot of political continuity and stability in the country. Mm -hmm. So this need to find an enemy mm -hmm. is not so pronounced. And mm -hmm. I think that's largely true for much of Southeast Asia as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I, at the same time, I think we also have to give some credit to the, what I call the Indonesian spirit of mm -hmm. tolerance. I mean, you mentioned... Mm -hmm. Of course, Nazi Germany. But mm -hmm. if you look even more recently at Yugoslavia, as you know, look mm -hmm. at Serbia and Kosovo. Exactly. When mm -hmm. they have an entity that is of a different culture, they mm -hmm. find it very difficult to live with it. Whereas in Indonesia, for example, mm -hmm. I'm actually amazed how Indonesians, from no matter what their religion is, are very proud of Bali. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even the Bali is a Hindu mm -hmm. uh, entity within uh, mm -hmm. Indonesia. And actually, they feel a sense of ownership, as you mm -hmm. said, also mm -hmm. of Bali. And mm -hmm. how do you explain that? That in some ways, the Muslims in Indonesia seem to be much more tolerant. Well, I think it's not simply Bali. I mean, you know, I mean, of course, Bali is the most well-known because it's a tourist destination. But I think generally, Indonesians take pride in you know, the diverse patchwork of cultures that they have in their society, whether it's the Toraja Highlands in, in Sulawesi, whether it's the Batak Lands in Sumatra. I'm not suggesting that it's all hunky-dory and everyone's yeah, living, you know, this, this is not Woodstock. <laughs> everyone's not holding hands, That's you know. Right. We're not, you know, it's not a, a, yeah, right. a big perpetual love That's fest right, yeah. here. We have to admit that there are also, there have been times where, where there's been, you know, enormous tension. Hmm. For instance, you know, shortly after the fall of Suharto, I mean, what happened in Kalibantan, where you had ethnic violence between Dayaks and Madhuris, yeah. for instance. But by and large, again, I think the key here is, is, you know, continuity and stability. When you have continuity and stability, the need for enemies, the search for a scapegoat, the search for, you know, a victim is not there. And when, when you have that basic fundamental requirement met, I think there is a relationship between having your basic needs met and being able to live with diversity and difference. Mm. It's not only Bali that Indonesians are, are proud of. They're, you know, when you when you look at any Indonesian tourist, you mm -hmm. know, ad, yeah, they showcase every part of the country. Having said this, I think you know Indonesians themselves would be very consciously aware of the fact that some parts of the country are perhaps not given the same treatment. You know, I mean, mm. one issue that has popped up of late, of course, mm. is the depiction of West Papuans mm. in Indonesian pop culture or the mm. news or what have you. you know? So we do have these these uh, differences mm. as well. Sure. You know, so far, we've been talking about maritime Southeast Asia, mm. Indonesia, mm. and the Philippines. Let's now mm. move over to mainland <laughs> Southeast Asia and come to Thailand. Mm. Thailand, of course, mm. is the most populous Buddhist state in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, and even though it's a largely Buddhist state, when you arrive at a massive mm -hmm. Sumanabumi airport in Bangkok, mm -hmm. you're greeted by, again, a, stat a statue mm -hmm. that is a Hindu statue, mm -hmm. a huge Hindu statue of Vishnu and the churning of the ocean of milk mm -hmm. greets visitors. Mm -hmm. So again, it's interesting that mm. a Buddhist country is showcasing mm. its Hindu heritage. Mm. And what, what would your comment be on the significance of that? Yes, the statue you're referring to is the famous uh, Samudra Mantan, which we see in the lobby the moment That's we, right. we, we exactly. get off the plane, right? And again, I think you have the same message being conveyed to visitors and also to Thais themselves that again... You know, yes, this is a Buddhist majority country, but let's not forget the fact that you know we we have these other cultural connections as well. And I think the message that we see being restated, whether it's the case of the Philippines example you gave earlier, or Indonesia, or Thailand, is that in many parts of Southeast Asia, 
this idea that, you know, these different belief systems can coexist side by side is something that we ought to value and ought to be proud of. And in many parts of Southeast Asia, as you know, yeah, Kishore, you know, I mean, you and I have traveled around this region a lot, whether it's in Bangkok or in Jakarta or in Malacca, Mm. It's not uncommon in our part of the world, in this mm. region of ours, right? You mean within one square mile, you can have a mosque, a church, a temple mm. right next to each other, mm-hmm. right? And I think this is something that, you know, early on you talk about the Balkans, you know, this mm. is something that, you know, even Europeans don't seem to appreciate. Yes. Yeah. For all the talk of diversity that you have in even some of these West European countries, you don't see things like that. Look mm. at the controversies that you have, you know, in some European countries when someone wants to build a mosque or a Buddhist temple or whatever, and, and, and people write petitions and say, oh, no, 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 we, you know, we can't have minarets or we can't have temples in our town mm. or whatever. Mm. This has never been an issue mm. in Southeast Asia, mostly, mostly. Yeah, mm. it's not been an issue. And I think the Thai example is just another instance of this, you know, mm. a point that I think we keep reiterating again and again for the right reasons. Well, so far we've been talking about peace, mm. now on the bring in war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And indeed, one of the most recent skirmishes that took place in Southeast Asia was actually within two Buddhist countries, mm. Thailand and Cambodia. Mm. And the dispute was over Priya Vihya. Mm. And you have actually written about your visit to the mm. Priya Vihya temple around that time, mm. where you say the mood around the border zone itself was uh, calm. And I encountered Thais and Cambodians on both sides of the border who do not regard their neighbours as the enemy. Now, since the goal of this Asian peace programme is actually to prevent wars in Southeast Asia also... Can you talk a little bit about what was the real cause of this military conflict in Priya Vihya and what lessons can we learn from it? Firstly, the Priya Vihya conflict revolved around claims by two different states over one particular historical monument, which was the Priya Vihya temple, with Thailand claiming that it's, you know, Thai and, and in Cambodia saying that it's Cambodian. I'm not going to comment about the temple itself, although many historians of classical architecture would say that in terms of its style, it does look more Cambodian than Thai. But the point is, this occurred at a border zone. And when we go to the border zones, yeah, and I've done a lot of work at border zones, you know, borders between Malaysia and Indonesia, between Malaysia and Philippines, between Malaysia and Thailand. When you go to the border zones, what's really interesting in the border zones of, you know, Southeast Asia is how so many people who live at the border have very little animosity towards their neighbours. Mm. Why? Because that's your actual human neighbour in front of you, right? Mm. I mean, a very good example would be the Malaysia-Thai border. Malaysians are crossing it, Thais are crossing it, they cross it every day because their friends are next door, you know, Mm. they cross the river on the boat, they go over, they have coffee with their friends, they come back. These are human beings. Mm. These are human beings. These are my friends, my relatives, my in-laws. They are not foreigners. And at that point, all the tools and all the instruments of the modern state today, the passport, the IC, the identity card, all these things sort of fall into you know, the background, they're not so important. What's important is that actual human contact. Mm. Now, when you look at the Priya Vihear uh, incident, when I met the Thais and the Cambodians you know, uh, at the border, uh, there was almost, I mean, basically no animosity at all because these are people who had for the longest time actually been crisscrossing the border all the time. Mm. And, and of course, Priya Vihear was an important tourist attraction, right? Mm. So both sides were actually making money of it because you know, they were selling food, they were selling drinks, they were selling, you know, uh, tourist trinkets and T-shirts mm. and things like that. Then the conflict arises. The conflict arises because it emanates from the political Mm centre. And I think one of the interesting things that I witnessed when I was there doing fieldwork was there was a demonstration organised at the site, but the Thais who live by the border told me that actually all these people who are coming to demonstrate are not from here. They're coming from (laughs) Bangkok. They're coming from Bangkok because this is a political rally, right? And I think this is the sort of thing that uh, sometimes we forget yeah. And and the news doesn't pick up, you know. So the news goes there's so, oh, you know, big demonstration, buses, yeah. busloads of people coming to yeah. demonstrate. But actually, no, they're not from here. They're from Bangkok. Yes, that's right. They're not locals. The locals have no animosity. Mm. But this is something that I think that we in ASEAN tend to forget. We are so focused on the mindset of people who live in the political center, the capitals. Mm. And we forget that when we talk about complexity and diversity in Southeast Asia, they're also communities that are living far away from Mm. the capital. Mm -hmm. And these border communities, you know, that that live at the border, say, between Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, or Malaysia and Indonesia, Malaysia and Philippines, these communities have their own organic linkages, Mm. you know, which which nobody, (laughs) except boring academics like me, you know, go and study. But but unfortunately, policymakers don't, don't actually see that. really 
glad you emphasized the fact that across many of the borders in Southeast Asia, the communities have a friendly relationship and we take it for granted. Mm-hmm. But of course, you see, not far from Southeast Asia, we also have borders which have been frozen. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a classic example. In terms of cultural similarity, mm-hmm. the cultural similarity of the border between India and Pakistan mm-hmm. is probably among the greatest in the world. Exactly. I can say this mm-hmm. with some conviction since I'm a Sindhi, a Hindu mm-hmm. Sindhi, mm-hmm. whose family left Karachi and Hyderabad and I've been there. Mm-hmm. And culturally, there's actually no distinction between the India-Pakistan border. And yet that border is completely frozen mm-hmm. and there's almost no human interaction, no mm-hmm. trade and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. So that makes the success of ASEAN mm-hmm. even more amazing. Mm-hmm. And as you know, I wrote a book called The uh, ASEAN Miracle. Mm-hmm. And I try to suggest in the book that one reason why ASEAN has been more successful than the mm-hmm. Gulf Cooperation mm-hmm. Council mm-hmm. or than SARC or mm-hmm. than any other mm-hmm. organization you can think of, because the Indonesians as the largest member mm-hmm of ASEAN didn't try to dominate ASEAN. In fact, exactly. they tried to inject the culture mm-hmm. of mushawara and mufakat or consultation and consensus. Mm-hmm. And looking back now, I have attended you know, mm-hmm. several hundred ASEAN meetings through a mm-hmm. quiet process of osmosis almost. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Indonesians injected this. Mm-hmm. So can you tell our listeners a bit about what is this mushawara and mufakat? Well, again, you know, the terms mushawara and mufakat. And here, this is another example of the cultural layering uh, mm-hmm. of Southeast Asia. The terms are of Arabic origin, but, you know, part of Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Melayu, Bahasa Malaysia now, you know, and they become part of our common vocabulary in Southeast Asia. So they come from, you know, um, Islamic or Muslim statecraft and governance. And the emphasis here is on finding some kind of consensus, which is, of course, not easy. But the idea is that, you know, consensus is important because, yes, of course, it's much easier if stronger countries, uh, you know, play a dominant role and basically lead the pack. But, you you know, you can lead the pack, but you lead the pack with resentment. Mm-hmm. You lead the pack and the pack will be reluctant. Mm-hmm. And the emphasis on Mushwara is the idea that, yes, you have to save face. Saving face, of course, is a very Asian thing. It's sometimes difficult for people like you and me to explain this to Westerners, you know, who, yes. who don't understand. But for us, you know, this idea of saving face. It's very never, critical. It's, yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical. It is absolutely critical that you cannot humiliate your partners in any kind of discussion. Which is, which is why when the Trump administration kept insulting China, I thought, my God, you don't understand. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Public insults are the worst thing you do in e- Asia. Exactly, you know, which is never... Ever, you know, somehow diminish the credibility and, and the standing and status of your partner because you want to work together. Now, as you know, yeah, Kishore, mm-hmm. we do have pressing issues in Southeast Asia. We have, you know, serious environmental issues. We have serious political issues. Current difficulty that we see in, in Myanmar, for instance, mm-hmm. critics of ASEAN will say basically, you see, you know, this is why sometimes Mushawara doesn't work. No one's saying, I'm not suggesting that mm-hmm. Mushawara is a fail-proof system. I don't think Mushawara solves all our mm-hmm. problems. However, as a condition, it has at least allowed ASEAN and Southeast Asia to evolve to where it is now, where we at least do not have, you know, one dominant super state trying to, to run the course for the rest of the region. And I agree with you, you know, I mean, one of the reasons why Mushawara is so important is that it's prevented the rise of a hegemonic power within Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. If any country, any country with, say, a large population attempts to you know, lead ASEAN, I think that would do infinitely more damage to ASEAN than anything else. It would be just like these other models you gave earlier, you know, when America tries to dominate a body uh, o- like that. OAS. OAS, yeah. right? Yeah. Then, then basically... It dies. It dies. I'm really glad you emphasized mm-hmm. that. And I think that's the one of the hidden reasons for ASEAN success. Indonesia hasn't tried to dominate mm-hmm. ASEAN. And here, of course, the Southeast Asia has either the great benefit and privilege or the great challenge... Mm-hmm of living with the two of the most largest and most populous countries mm-hmm. in the world, mm-hmm. <laughs> China and India, mm-hmm. close to its borders. Mm-hmm. As we discussed mm-hmm. earlier, the Ramayana, mm-hmm. the Mahabharata, all come from India to towards Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that even though Southeast Asia has traditionally been receiving cultural influences mm-hmm. from China and India, I wonder whether the time has come for Southeast Asia to reciprocate mm-hmm. 
and share some of its influence on, for example, India, mm. making India, for example, more accepting of diversity mm. within South Asia and accepting the fact that Pakistan mm. will always be different, mm -hmm. right? And similarly, mm. encouraging China to accept mm. diversity mm. and learn to live with neighbors with whom they may have had problems in the past, mm -hmm. but you got to mm. live with them again. Mm -hmm. So let's say if you're a private minute with Prime Minister <laughs> Narendra Modi mm. or private minute with President Xi Jinping, mm. what would you say to them? What lessons can they learn from Southeast Asia? Well, I, I doubt that that private minute will ever happen, but... They, they may hear this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Let's, 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 let's look at India first. Well, I think what, what we've seen in India, and you know, India's own political history has been a very complex one. In the 80s, as you know, India was very much aligned to the Soviet Union. You know, mm. it, you know, it was aligned to countries that were left mm. of center and what mm. have you. And that period where its politics was inclined to the left and you know, was also the period where some people would argue India had a greater degree of tolerance for the complexity and diversity of its own country. Now, what we've seen in India in recent times, and let's be blunt here, yeah, mm. is a, a sustained effort to somehow deny or erase its non-Hindu other. This has been targeted particularly towards Muslims and to some extent Christians as well in the country. And I think, of course, this would have implications because it has implications within India. It has implications with its neighbors, you know, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So the, the lesson would be, well, look at us in Southeast Asia. We, we deal with complexities. You have now voices in India who are even saying things like the Taj Mahal is an insult to India because it's a mm. symbol of, you know, foreign domination, Mughal domination or what mm. have you. Compare that to Southeast Asia, where, you know, we, we don't go around demolishing traces of external cultural influence or whatever. Or Hindu influence in or, or Southeast Hindu, Asia. Yeah, we don't, yeah. because we, we celebrate it instead. So there are a lot of lessons, and I agree with you. You know, we have lessons to give as well, lessons mm. to teach as well. And the same would apply to, to China. When we look at, you know, we talk about not only China's relations with, say, Japan, right? Mm. Of course, nobody is denying that, you know, atrocities, horrific atrocities were committed, you know, in the 30s and 40s by Japan in China. But if you look at Southeast Asia, look at how, you know, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia reconciled after Confrontasi. Mm -hmm. We took a pragmatic view. We said there's no point harping on about the past. Yes, there was this moment of conflict. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was true. People died. You know, there were even mm -hmm. attacks here in Singapore, mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. right? But pragmatism and above all utilitarianism, took precedent. We mm -hmm. must somehow come together. Mm -hmm. And this paved the way for the creation of ASEAN in 1967. Mm -hmm. So I think there, when you look at East Asia, these countries, Japan, Korea, China, have got mm -hmm. a lot of historical baggage. Mm -hmm. I'm not denying mm -hmm. the importance of this historical baggage. But we in Southeast Asia also have historical baggage. You know, Burma mm -hmm. and, uh, or Myanmar and Thailand, for instance, have had many wars in mm -hmm. their past. That's right. But have been able to somehow work out a pragmatic working relationship where they can coexist uh, mm -hmm. with one another. So I think in East Asia, no one is saying that we should erase the past or forget the historical baggage. But if you keep being beholden to that historical baggage, you can't create new histories. Mm -hmm. You can't move on. You can't move on and you can't create new histories. Mm -hmm. That, I think, would apply to China's relation with Japan. But also when it talk about the internal diversity, China itself is a very complex country, mm -hmm. right? And I think what applies to India also applies to China. I mean, look at the treatment of the Uyghurs in China at the moment, mm -hmm. which all the reports are pointing to a somewhat horrible situation where you have the systematic erasure of the culture of an entire community. Again, the question is, you know, why can't, you know, these states deal with diversity and difference? If there's one thing at least you and I can see in the case of Southeast Asia's history, mm. I don't think we've ever come to a point, you know, even at the worst parts of our history and our recent past, you know, mm. I don't think we've ever come to a point where we see the systematic eradication of entire cultures in Southeast mm. Asia, minority cultures, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what's happening in other parts of Asia is quite alarming for us. Mm -hmm. And I think for many Southeast Asians, this is incomprehensible. Just for a minute, I know this is a very difficult question. For me, I find it very sad that the situation within India and Pakistan mm -hmm. is completely frozen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's not even normal trade between mm -hmm. these two countries. Mm -hmm. By contrast, uh, China and Vietnam fought a war much more recently. Mm -hmm. you know, the last India-Pakistan war was 1971. Mm -hmm. The last China-Vietnam war was 1979. Mm -hmm. And despite that, today you go to the China-Vietnam border, the mines are gone, the soldiers are gone, and there's normal trade, you know. 
So what would you tell India and Pakistan? Should they go and study China and Vietnam and see why is it this region still can find ways and means of getting along despite having phenomenal differences? Yeah, I think it's um, advice that could be given not only to India and Pakistan, but many countries. You know, have likewise reached this kind of deadlock. Uh, you know, mm. uh, the animosity between Greece and Turkey, for instance. Mm. You know, I mean, there are many instances of these countries that have deep distrust of, of one mm. another. And I think Southeast Asia is full of examples of countries that have overcome this distrust. Mm. And sometimes, you know, it pays to be pragmatic. I mean, mm. what's the point of prolonging this? What's the point? Again, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I'm not talking about historical Eurasia. I'm not mm. saying that, okay, let's forget Mm. You know, Japanese atrocities in Southeast Asia in World War II. I'm, mm. no, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. Mm. But I'm saying that while we remember, we also have to remember in a manner that does not prevent us from moving on. The problem, particularly in the case that you cite, yeah, India, Pakistan, is that when remembrance happens, it happens for an instrumental reason. Mm. I'm going to remember this because I'm going to use this against you. You hurt my feelings. You did this mm. to me. You, 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 you. And so memory, historical memory, then becomes instrumental and very mm. political. And Kishore, you and I both know, right? I mean, history is a very political discipline, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yes. especially when it becomes national histories. When it's national histories, mm. states use history in order to have you know, particular agendas, particularly when they are dealing with other states. Mm. So I think this is my concern as a historian myself. As you know, the goal of the Asian peace talks is to try and bring about peace. And certainly we coming out with essays on India and Pakistan, I was thinking actually, just as in the course of talking to you, Indians claim that the reason why they have a problem in Pakistan is because Pakistan claims part of Kashmir and so we cannot live in peace with Pakistan and so on and so forth. And yet what is interesting is I just thought about it. In Southeast Asia, actually, you still have a situation where Philippines still claim Sabah. <laughs> and despite that, despite the fact that Philippines hasn't given up its claim on Sabah, Malaysia and Philippines have got normal relations, have diplomatic relations, have trade with each other, continue cooperation, exactly. and so on and so forth, you know. So I guess you're right. You can either refer to the negative mm. historical memory or mm -hmm. negative mm -hmm. claim of today, or you can put that aside and move on. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about Southeast Asian states is that most of the time they say, yes, 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 we have differences. But let's put that aside mm -hmm. and focus on the pragmatic utilitarian reasons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for collaboration. Mm -hmm. So again, that makes Southeast Asia very unique. Mm -hmm. yeah, and this goes back to you know that earlier point about Mushawara yeah, and yeah. Mafakat, that we have to work together. It's like a family. We think of ourselves as a family, right? So even in any family, you know, um, yeah. the husband and wife don't agree all the time. The mother yes. and father don't agree with the kids all the time. But yeah. somehow you have to continue. And and yeah. many families, you know, actually live and prosper that way, despite their differences. You know, even mm. I disagree with my mother, for heaven's sakes, right? We don't expect homogeneity. Mm. And, and this is the thing. I think because we are acutely aware that we are all, you know, complex countries, because we know we are internally complex, we... I think are more comfortable with complexity in our relations with one mm. another as well. So we don't expect homogeneity. Mm. So we're not trying to turn ASEAN into an EU-like institution, which mm. is a legal body, you know, which yes. has laws that can regulate and all that. Yes, you know? yes. uh, we don't micromanage and we don't macromanage either. Mm. And I think that's a good thing. And that's why, yes, you know, we all have baggage. You have baggage. I have baggage. Even mm. as individuals, we have baggage. Mm. But we don't let that stand in the way. Mm -hmm. Because there's something else. There's the family to think about. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what's missing. When you look at East Asia, mm -hmm. East Asian states don't think of mm -hmm. East Asia as their homeland. Mm -hmm. South Asian states might mm -hmm. be next to each other, but they don't think of a Southeast Asian history and destiny together. Mm -hmm. We in Southeast Asia, we often talk about our common destiny together. Sink mm -hmm. or swim, mm -hmm. we live together. together. Because we saw this, right, in the economic crisis, 97, 98. When one economy collapses, we all collapse, mm -hmm. right? So we are like a large extended family in a huge house. And mm -hmm. the house has got many sections, many rooms. But if one room is on fire, eventually all of us are going to get burned. Mm -hmm. So we've come together because we have a kind of common familial relation with one another. You know, if mm. you look at the words that we use, we use words that are not used in other parts of, mm. of Asia. We use words like rumpun. You know, we, we belong to a common family. We belong mm. to a common keluarga. You know, we don't find this vocabulary in many other parts of the world. Yeah, you're right. I hope that the people listening to this podcast mm. will now get excited and energized mm. about learning about Southeast Asia 
and learning from uh, scholars like you. But I can tell you, if I had a wish or a dream of someone I would like to do a podcast with today on Southeast Asia, it would be someone whom you also know very well, mm-hmm. Ben Anderson. Mm-hmm. And as you know, he created mm-hmm. the concept of Imagine Communities. And one of the greatest privileges of my life is that I actually had lunch with him just a few months before he passed mm-hmm. away. Uh, I had lunch with him in Bangkok when I was doing research mm-hmm. for my book, ASEAN Miracle. And he, amazingly enough, for a Western mm-hmm. foreigner, mm-hmm. developed a very deep understanding first of Indonesia. And then, unfortunately, mm-hmm. Suharto mm-hmm. evicted him from mm-hmm. Indonesia. Yes. Then he developed a very deep, equally deep understanding of Thailand, you know. Mm. If Ben Anderson were alive today and we were having a three-way conversation Mm. with him, trying to imagine if he's in this room, Mm -hmm. what would you say would be his points Mm. on what makes Southeast Asia unique? Mm. For example, what would you see as the key similarities between Indonesia, a populous Muslim country, Mm. and Thailand, a populous Buddhist country? Mm. What would he point to? Well, you know, here we're guessing, but he might allude to a common imaginary where many parts of Southeast Asia, we do seem to feel that this region is a a common homeland for all of us. Hmm. And I'll give you an example of this. Years ago, when I was doing research in Bangkok, I came across a group of students from an architectural school in Indonesia. Hmm. Uh, the school was based in Jakarta. So they were there on a field trip. They were studying Thai architecture. And I thought, this is, hmm. you're a committed ASEANist. I'm yeah. a committed ASEANist. So hmm. We like to see stuff like this, right? Hmm. So it was wonderful Indonesian hmm. kids in Bangkok studying Thai architecture. So I asked them what they were doing and, you know, how they felt. And I think one of the best things that one of them said to me was that, I asked them, you know, how do you feel as an Indonesian studying Thai architecture? Hmm. That was my question. And his response was, and I loved his response, his response was, but... This is our architecture. (laughs) We are Southeast Asians. This is our architecture. Ah. And I thought, you know, at that moment, I thought if if I got struck by lightning, I would die a happy man. (laughs) Yes. Because I thought, you know, this is like one step closer to my dream of a common sense of Southeast Asian-ness. Yes. That is not couched on, you know, hyper-nationalism or pride or you're you're better than everyone else. Not not that. Not not arrogant. Not arrogant. Not not pompous, not xenophobic, but a simple mundane consciousness that if you really look at the architecture of Indonesia, Mm. Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, you see the similarities, then Mm. you realise actually this is our common Tanah Air homeland, you know. Mm. And that's what I as a Southeast Asian feel. I feel at home in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. Whether I'm in Vietnam or Indonesia or Philippines or, mm-hmm. or Thailand or Malaysia or Singapore, mm-hmm. of course, you know, I feel I'm still at home. Mm-hmm. I feel I'm abroad when I'm in England. <laughs> I feel abroad when I'm in, in uh, America. I feel yeah. abroad when I'm in South Africa or, or Morocco or whatever. There yeah. I feel abroad, but not in Southeast Asia. Yeah, I, I completely agree with mm-hmm. you. you know, as you said, we are both... Mm-hmm passionate ASEANists. And when I grew up as a child in Singapore, I was always told that we live in a terrible region, Southeast Asia. And London, of course, is heaven because there the streets are paved with gold. I'm not exaggerating. That's that's what I was told as a child. So as an adult now to discover actually how wonderful Southeast Asia is, how special Southeast Asia is, how Southeast Asia can be really a great model for the rest of the world, Mm -hmm. including in issues of war and peace Mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's actually quite remarkable. But I want to conclude now by trying to reach out to not just scholars Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, great pundits, Mm -hmm. but to the ordinary people, Mm -hmm. the taxi drivers and all. And I remember you saying to me that when you produced your TV series, My Southeast Asia with Dr. Farish, mm-hmm. you was greatly heartened by the fact that taxi drivers would recognize mm-hmm. you and not take a fare from you because they loved your program mm-hmm. so much. So my question is, if you had a final message now to, mm-hmm. let's say, the taxi drivers, the man in the street, the school teachers, mm-hmm. the cleaners, whatever it is, and you tried to explain to them what's really special about Southeast Asia, what else would you say to them? I would say to the auntie and the uncle and the student and the primary school student, I would say that we are fortunate to live in a region that is really interesting, really special. And I think we should not make the mistake of thinking that just because we live next to each other, we know each other. 
This is the most common mistake. Many Southeast Asians think that just because they live next to another Southeast Asian country, they know each other. We assume that proximity means knowledge. That's not true. You and I can have neighbours. It doesn't mean that we actually know our neighbours. In fact, sometimes yeah. we don't know our neighbours at all. So just because we live next to one another doesn't mean we know each other automatically. And that's why we should really travel. We should know our region. And as we come to know our region, as we visit our neighbours, as you know, Singaporeans go to Malaysia, Malaysians go to Thailand, Thais go to Cambodia or what have you, you'll discover two things. One, how similar we are rather than how different we are, you know. You know, we talk about soft power and soft diplomacy as an antidote, you know, to violent forms of nationalism and xenophobia and hatred for foreigners, right? Once you recognize that your neighbor is actually a human being like you, not mm. perfect, you know, with their own lives, with their own problems, with their own issues, you know, then actually that human bond will grow. And I think this is something I want all Southeast Asians to feel, and I think we are very fortunate that we live in a world, I mean, okay, unfortunately not now because of COVID, but before this, you know, we were free to travel, we mm. were free to move. Uh, the example I gave earlier about the Indonesian students studying Thai architecture, mm. we are learning more about each other. Let's hope that COVID, you know, will come under control within a couple of years. I hope to see a future generation of Southeast Asians who increasingly feel that the whole of Southeast Asia mm. is a place that's homely, welcoming, and familiar. We should never feel like we are foreigners in our own region. And I think that would be my message, not only to the aunties and the uncles, but also to the school children, the school teachers, and you and me and all of us. This is our home. Southeast Asia is our home. And I think we should feel at home, which means you feel loved, appreciated, comfortable, even with all the differences that we have among one another. Well, that's a wonderful positive note <laughs> on which to end our discussion because at the end of the day, when you look around the whole world, and there are 7.8 billion people in the world, it's hard to find any region in the world that is as diverse as Southeast Asia and also equally hard to find a region where most of the time, most Southeast Asian countries get along very well with each other despite the many differences uh, that they have. So I share your hope that uh, young Southeast Asians will discover the magic of Southeast Asia. And I also hope that all the other great pundits and gurus around the world who always look at American and European examples should now study the Southeast Asian case study if they want to bring more peace in the world. And bringing more peace in the world, of course, is the goal of the Asian Peace Programme. And I thank you very much, Farish, for joining the Asian Peace Talk. Thank you for having me.